Yes, uh, good evening. And I would uh, first of all like to thank the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation for inviting me to Berlin and uh, supporting my book tour of Europe. I would also like to express my regret that Professor Wolfram Shafar is not able to join us uh, owing to unexpected developments, but it's great that Mulane is here to, uh, to um, uh, be my counterpart uh, tonight. It is also good to be among old friends. I have uh, had a long, long relationship with the RLS, uh, as well as the Delinke, the party Delinke, of which I am an honorary member. And um, although I haven't paid my dues for about 10 years or so, <laughs> but nobody's collected, so I imagine it's honorary dues. <laughs> okay. um, so uh, the um, reason I am in Berlin tonight is to launch my book, Counter Revolution The Global Rise of the Far Right, which is uh, available here that was commissioned by the Transnational Institute and the Emancipatory Rural Politics Initiative, or ERPI, that is based out of the Institute for Social Studies in The Hague. The book is largely an exploration of the dynamics of transformative change using the theoretical paradigm of revolution and counter-revolution. While there are sections on developments in Europe, the United States, and Brazil, the book focuses on the dynamics of counter-revolution in five societies in the global south, Indonesia, Chile, Thailand, the Philippines, and India. I will not summarize the book since that would provide less incentive for you to buy it. Uh, and my publishers would get upset at me. Uh, there are, however, a few preliminary points I would like to make before I move to the main topic of my talk. One of them is that I have avoided using the term populism to describe movements of the far right because populism does not offer any substantive light on the essence, programs, and directions of these movements. Populism is a political style one marked by a direct appeal to people that seeks to mobilize them beyond the channels of institutionalized parliamentary politics. Thus, there are populists of the right and populists of the left. Um, instead of populism, I have elected to describe these movements of the far right as counter-revolutionary because the term gives us a much better sense of what drives them. In the book, I look at two types of counter-revolutionary movement. The first is the counter-revolution that is a response to a revolution, revolution being defined here broadly as an insurgent challenge from below to change the social and political regime. This challenge may not be revolutionary, but reformist in its strategy but it is nevertheless seen as very threatening to the survival of the status quo. In the case studies I take up in the book, the processes that unfold in fascist Italy in 1920 to 22, Indonesia in 1965, Chile in 1970 to 73, and Thailand from 2001 to 2014 fall into this category of counter-revolution. Using a revolution-counter-revolution -revolution paradigm, we can also appreciate the play of various actors. And here, I borrow the great social and diplomatic historian Arno Meyer's classification of the actors of what he calls the, quote, anti-revolutionary triad, unquote. And these actors are, one, the reactionaries who want to bring back the past, Two, the conservatives who may not want to bring back the past but defend the status quo. And three, the counter-revolutionaries. The third type, the counter-revolutionaries, are the most interesting theoretically and dangerous, most dangerous politically, since they adopt both the mass mobilization style associated with the left and expropriate some of the left's issues, at least rhetorically, 
in order to advance an anti-progressive agenda. The second type of counter-revolution explored in the book is the one that is a reaction not to an insurgent challenge, but to the failure of the paradigm of rule to deliver on its promises on the parts of groups that had totally put their faith in it. The current manifestations of this kind of counter-revolution are the movements against liberal democracy, both in the global south and the global north. These movements deserve the term counter-revolution because they seek to displace the dominant, the current dominant liberal democratic regime with an authoritarian form of rule. The challenge they pose, moreover, is not only political, but ideological, one that questions the basic values and processes of liberal democracy, such as secularism, respect for diversity, equality, and due process. The totalistic challenge posed by this second type of counter-revolution is captured by the words of one very prominent or one very notorious right-wing leader during the 20th century who said that the movement he belonged to sought to, quote, erase 1789 from history, unquote. While unlike Joseph Goebbels, they may not have phrases that explicitly express their hatred and contempt for liberal democracy, the actions of Rodrigo Duterte of the Philippines and Narendra Modi of India, the two figures we will be discussing here tonight, carry the same message. The last preliminary point I would like to make is that in both kinds of counter-revolution, the middle class plays a central role. Now, the middle class is the great understudied class in sociology, its role often being reduced to that of reacting to the initiatives of the lower classes led by the left or to the initiatives of the elites. In fact, the behavior of the middle class has a dynamic of its own, and it displays agency, especially in a period of flux when it feels that its, threat, its interests are threatened. Having made these prelim preliminary points, let me now move to my main topic, which is to analyze a recent development in two of the countries discussed in the book, the Philippines and India, that is both the theoretically interesting and politically alarming. What I'd like to focus on is how and why democratic elections are paradoxically eroding what had been regarded as two of the most solidly liberal democratic systems in the South, that in the Philippines and that in India. And so the title of my um, um, uh, talk tonight, The Democratic Dilemma, Elections in the Far Right. Overall, the elections, national elections held earlier this year in both countries were relatively free and fair as even the opposition and international observers conceded, albeit grudgingly. Yet, in both countries, the results are likely to provide momentum towards our concentration of power in the hands of authoritarian personalities. Let's begin with the Philippines. President Rodrigo Duterte was not running for office, but everyone knew that the May 9, 13, 2019 election was a referendum on his three years in office. Now, if it were politics as usual in the Philippines, the president's record could have done him and his favored candidates for the Senate much damage. The worst inflation in nearly a decade, kowtowing to China, credible charges of hidden wealth, a penchant for misogynistic anti-women comments, a provocative anti-clerical attitude in an overwhelmingly Catholic country, intimidating the press, imprisoning or ousting from vo office vocal opponents, and perhaps most seriously, over 20,000 deaths, a large number owing to extrajudicial executions in his war on drugs. But it is not politics as usual in the Philippines. At the time of the elections, Duterte had an astonishing 81% approval rating, and the results of the elections drove this home. His favored candidates and allies captured all 12 
of the senatorial seats at stake. Not since the late 1980s had the opposition been completely shut out in a Senate race. As the results poured in on election night, May 13, it became clear that Duterte, warts and all, had been given an overwhelming mandate by the electorate, making him the most powerful occupy, uh, person to occupy the presidency since the dictator Ferdinand Marcos. Since electoral fraud was not a credible explanation for the results, some political commentators elected to blame the voters. Wrote one prominent journalist critical of Duterte, I quote, we have most of the voters to blame for it. They are the millions who approve of mass killings, who are indifferent to the violation of human rights, who despise intelligence and who've never read a book. They disparage democracy without knowing what it is and approve of tyranny because they can't tell the difference, unquote. Now, if the writer were a conservative intellectual, I would not have given his comments a second thought. But he was a, he, he a well-known man of the left who had previously written about the masses being the agents of history. His words reminded me of the thesis of Dan Daniel Goldhagen's controversial book, Hitler's Willing Executioner, exe Executioners, that ordinary Germans were complicit in Hitler's crimes because they knew full well what was going on and they approved of it. And indeed, when you look at the 20,000 people who have been killed in the Philippines, most Poles know that, that reflect the fact that people know that this mass murder has been going on. Uh, and yet, they approve of Duterte. But let us move to India. In contrast to Duterte, who had an astonishingly high approval rating, despite the existence of many serious problems faced by the Philippines, things did not seem auspicious for Narendra Modi and the ruling Hindu nationalist BJP at the beginning of the six-week-long electoral process in, in, in April. The annual growth rate was down to 5.8%. The economic crisis triggered by demonetization, that is, the sudden withdrawal from circulation of 500 to 1,000 rupee notes. Uh, hold on. Uh, I'm sorry about this. Uh, which represented 86% of the value of circulating currency was not over. Farmers' marches reminded the country of the crisis of agriculture, and violence spawned by an aggressive Hindu nationalism had become commonplace. Yet, after the votes were counted, the whole country was stupefied. The BJP had expanded its majority to 303 seats, 20 more than its 2014 tally. Congress, the main opposition party that had been the dominant force in the first 30 years of India, as an independent state was badly beaten, emerging with some, only some 52 seats, with its leader, Rahul Gandhi, losing in the fam family's traditional constituency, Amethi, in Uttar Pradesh. Modi came out stronger, much stronger, from an election where he had been expected to emerge much weaker. The desperate mood that engulfed those critical of Modi was captured by the words of one academic who claimed that his victory was, quote, a moment of dread for Indian democracy, end quote, because it had resulted, quote, in the greatest concentration of power in modern Indian history, end quote. Suddenly, the boast of BJP uh, boss, Amit Shah, that the BJP would rule India, quote, for the next 50 years, end quote, no longer seemed incredible. As in the Philippines, despairing liberals in India wondered what on earth made their compatriots, quote, outsource their destiny, unquote, to a strong man, as one of them put it. Just as the Philippine intelligentsia expressed wonderment at how serious charges would simply bounce off Duterte, Indian liberals could not figure out what it was that made voters across the board readily absolve Modi for the very real problems being faced by the country, whether this was rising unemployment, 
farmer suicides owing to economic distress, lynchings of Muslims accused of trading cattle, or the unsolved murders of prominent intellectuals. Even his party's endorsement of a known terrorist who had praised the assassin of Gandhi did not hurt Modi, leading one analyst to attribute his success to, quote, smart political communication, unquote, that consistently projected him as being above the fray. Now, controlling the narrative was certainly part of the explanation for Modi's success, as it was for Duterte's. Modi's discourse placed him and the BJP as the agents of India's economic development and the restoration of Hindu civilization's ancient greatness. Duterte combined an earthy discourse that many saw as refreshingly free of the usual liberal democratic froth with a stern message of cleansing the country of the drag menace that was, quote, destroying the youth of my country, unquote, according to Duterte. This analysis, however, assumes the relationship between the voters and the strong man is a one-way street. For as anyone who has lived through the tumultuous politics of both countries in the last few years would not have failed to note the very real synergy or mutually constructive relationship between the strong men and their people. For other analysts, Duterte and Modi had tangible achievements that overrode the problems pointed out by their opponents. In the case of Modi, for instance, voters were said to appreciate his campaign to build a toilet for every household, his free LNG, uh, liquid natural gas connections for poor families, in a program of giving 6,000 rupees a year to subsistence farmers. These material benefits do not, however, add up to a viable explanation for the massive mandate. Politics in India and the Philippines today is not arithmetic, to use a famous Filipino politician's inimitable description of democracy. Promising and providing goods and services is the stuff of patronage politics of the democratic politics as usual. But what is happening in both countries today is a political earthquake, a massive transformative change, a fundamental reconfiguration of politics. At the epicenter of this earthquake is a discontented citizenry, and it is as much an agent of change as the unorthodox personalities that have found a way to unlock its swirling passions. The focus on citizens' discontent of liberal with liberal democracy, the focus of citizens' discontent is a system of liberal democracy that has simply not delivered on its promises. Writes Pankaj Misra, a prominent author, and I quote, India is a grotesquely unequal society. A great majority of Indians forced to inhabit the vast gap between a glossy democratic ideal and a squalid democrat and democratic reality have long stored up deep feelings of injury, weakness, inferiority, degradation, inadequacy, and envy. This is stem from defeats or humiliations suffered at the hands of those of higher status than, than themselves in a rigid hierarchy. This could be a description of 21st century Philippines as well. It is the explosive synergy between a di deeply disaffected citizenry and a political personality who has captured their imagination and on whom they have rested their dreams and aspirations for the future that today drives politics in both countries. It is perhaps easier to understand this dynamic in the case of Modi, who unites a dynamic personality to an aggressive ideology of wounded but assertive nationalism that has tapped into the country's feelings of pride and shame, deep disappointment, and persistent hope. Yet, Duterte is, in his own way, a magnetic personality, bringing together a tough law and order stance, a discourse that is deliberately politically incorrect, and the image of the quote-unquote punisher, unquote who has what it takes to tame exploitative elites and discipline a people that famously regard themselves as rowdy and undisciplined. The very qualities that liberals despise in Duterte is what enables him to connect with the masses, 
especially with the volatile middle classes that feel most sharply the yawning gap between aspirations and the possibilities of fulfilling them in the, quote, really existing democratic dispensation. The connection that has been forged between strong personalities and their people has ushered in a period that may best be described as one where charismatic politics has displaced democracy as usual. Here, we might take a leaf from the great sociologist Max Weber, who saw what he called charismatic authority or legitimacy as a dynamic transformative process that overwhelms both traditional authority and rational legal authority and structures that coexist in society. Charismatic politics exploits the contradiction between traditional authority structures that legitimize inequality and injustice and a rational legal order based on the principles of democracy, justice, and equality. Charismatic politics is not politics as usual and is a fluid process that moves in uncharted waters until the charisma of the leader is, according to Weber, routinized, quote unquote, into a new set of rules, procedures, and processes which become the new source of authority and legitimacy. Charismatic legitimacy is hardly benign. Indeed, it almost invariably ends up with a dangerous concentration of power in the hands of the charismatic individual. In equally alarming, its emergence has been accompanied by the imaginative recreation of an other or others upon whom the ills, contradictions, and disharmony of society are projected. The achievement of social harmony is dependent on the excision or neutralization of the other or others. In the case of the Philippines, drug users, liberal politicians, and communists. In the case of India, Muslims, Christians, westernized intellectuals, and Marxists. It does not take much for the leader and his disciples to set the mob on this quote-unquote enemies of the people, unquote, as persecuted communities in, the, in India would readily testify. A key feature of the dynamics of charismatic politics is that it is both authoritarian and intensely quote-unquote democratic. On the one hand, followers are willing to hold their critical faculties in abeyance, ready to give the leader the benefit of the doubt, even when they may not agree with everything that he or she stands for or promotes. On the other hand, it is through the mediation of the electoral process, through direct contact with the masses during the campaign, and through their act of willingly voting for him or his anointed ones, that the leader renews his or her legitimacy. Manage elections, like the one that took place in Thailand during the same period uh, that the military supervised and the military party won through management of the elections, these kind of elections are fatal for charismatic authority. Indeed, the less controlled and more spontaneous the expression of approval, the greater the legitimacy that can be turned into even greater power. India and the Philippines have gone through relatively free elections that by bestowing greater legitimacy on them is paradoxically or are paradoxically leading to the concentration of even greater power in the hands of charismatic authoritarian personalities who are intent on doing away with the post-World War II liberal democratic dispensation and leading their consenting citizens to a brave new world. Let me say that I'm not saying that the politics of class is irrelevant to our understanding of the dynamics of politics in India and the Philippines. Neoliberal economic policies have been central in both creating discontent against liberal democracy as well as generating support for capitalism uh, among new, the new middle classes that the insurgent authoritarian elites have capitalized on. But as with classical fascism, the relationship between capitalism and political counter-revolution is not simple and can best be understood if we theoretically grant the realm of politics 
significant autonomy from the economy and see factors such as personality, culture, and the people not as passive but as active agents in the radical right-wing restructuring of society that is taking place. Let me give you one example of this very real relative autonomy of the political. The social and economic elites have congregated around Duterte, not only because he is seen as supportive of their interests, but also because they fear that the charismatic authority that he has, uh, that he has can also be used to discipline them and dismantle their economic empires. This is indeed the reason why some progressives and former progressives back Duterte. Despite his accommodation with the elites, they still hope that he will turn the power of the state against them, a hope that is nurtured by his high-profile firing of some members of his cabinet accused of corruption. Like Hitler, Mussolini, Orban, Trump, Le Pen, and other far-right personalities, Duterte and Modi have arrived at some accommodation with the economic elites, but they are not the ser servants of the latter. I do not think we have time to compare the features of the far-right movements in the North with those in the South, nor do we have time to tackle the very important task of discussing how we are to counter the new um, authoritarianism. Maybe we can discuss the urgent questions more at length in the question and answer period. But let me say in this connection that in any response to the far right, we cannot abandon our defense of due process, human rights, diversity, the rights of the minorities, and other democratic values. At the same time, we cannot just be defensive. In this regard, and as a transition to the discussion of alternatives, in the question and answer session, let me quote President Duterte's fiercest crit critic, the jailed Senator Laila de Lima, uh, to illustrate the conjuncture we face in places like India and the Philippines today. De Lima says that the old liberal democracy is a system whose time has passed, but that, quote, the alternative to Dutertismo or Dutertism still has to be born, unquote. And until then, the people will continue to be entranced by Duterte. It is important to fully understand and appreciate the dynamics of Dutertismo and Hindu nationalism and not reduce their hegemony to a simple question of people being manipulated or brainwashed if we are to meet the urgent challenge of coming up with a viable antidote to them. And with that, I thank you very much for allowing me to share my thoughts with you on this very important question. And I hope that we can all share our ideas together on how we can best uh, uh, um, cooperate um, uh, our efforts in order to be able to meet this challenge that confronts our societies, both in the North and in the Global South at this point in time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Bello, for giving us these insights, especially into the situation in the Philippines and India. So in the preliminary points you made, you emphasized the role of the middle class for these counter-revolutionary regimes. And I found this very interesting because I think that also in the discussions we have in Germany about the success of the far right, the middle class is often underrepresented. So we speak a lot about the voters from the working class and why they turned away from social democratic or from leftist parties but not so much about the relatively high support for far-right and authoritarian politics that we can find among the middle class. So maybe you could elaborate a bit on that. Um, what exactly is the role of the middle class in these counter-revolutionary regimes? Okay, uh, this, is, this is a really interesting question. Um, um, the, uh, my experience as a sociologist and a political activist um, began with Chile and the overthrow of Allende in 1973. To in 1973. And um, that um, experience really inoculated me against any sort of glorification of the role of the middle class. And the reason for this is that it was the middle class that was the mass base of uh, counter-revolution that um, overthrew Allende. 
that um, unless we see that this was a counter revolution based on the middle class, uh, we cannot understand what happened in Chile. Uh, that still is an experience that haunts so many of us. The simple explanation that people had was that um, the CIA overthrew Allende. And unfortunately, both on the left and among liberal scholars, that was sort of the, that was sort of the analysis. But I have written about this, and I said that, yes, definitely the role of the CIA was there, but it could not have been effective unless it was inserted into an active and dynamic counter-revolutionary process involving the middle class and the elites. Um, again, uh, in 2001 to 2014, uh, in a country that I have uh, lived in as well as participated in, I saw that the um, uh, middle class became the mass base of uh, counter-revolution against the populist movement based on the lower classes, especially the rural working classes, uh, rural classes, uh, led by uh, Takshin Shinawat. Um, and um, it was massive middle class mobilizations, of course, that the elite was also part of, that ended in the overthrow of Taksin's sister in 2014. And then you see this again uh, in the case of the Philippines, where we see that it is the, the, the strongest support for Duterte uh, is uh, in fact found in uh, you know, the middle class. Now, I'm not saying that there is not support for him in the other classes. In fact, his, his support is broad, uh, that goes broadly through all classes. Uh, but there is a difference, I think, because the active people that, uh, uh, that uh, what we might call uh, the ones who justify it mo very aggressively uh, are the middle class uh, people. And uh, uh, in fact, the polls would show that it is these groups that are most um, articulate in their support for uh, Duterte. And so I would borrow from Gramsci that distinguishes between active and passive consensus. I would say that the middle class is engaged in active consensus, whereas the rest of the uh, classes, lower classes in particular, are, are more passive in terms of the consensus that they have with respect to the regime. And again, uh, I think if you look at India, I think what are called the aspirational middle classes, the people that uh, had been, um, um, you know, that, that have benefited from neoliberalism uh, and the opening up of the Indian economy, although they may not be, uh, as uh, Christoph Jaffrelo has said, they might not be actually in economic status middle class. Nevertheless, their aspirations have become a uh, uh, kind of middle class. Uh, so, and they have played a very central role in the backing uh, for, uh, for, um, uh, for Modi. Although, as I said, we cannot just, there are many factors. There's also the cultural factor. There's the religious factor. Uh, so all of these have come together. Uh, but I would say that one cannot, in fact, um, one cannot uh, disregard the class question here. Uh, and the fact that the middle class, together, of course, with the, 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 the Indian bourgeoisie, has been very uh, uh, um, prominent in backing uh, uh, Modi. The only other thing that I would like to add here is, um, clearly, when you come to the United States, you, um, um, we have to qualify this idea of um, the working class and the middle class, because um, what 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 we see in the United States is definitely Trump was brought to power by the working class, uh, especially you know the Midwest working class. Uh, you know there was this these four states: uh, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Ohio, one other state that brought him over the top, uh, and that is his base at this point in time. But I think we also should realize that uh, in a country like the United States. These people don't think thems of themselves as working class. They think of themselves as middle class. 
that you know this is the great middle of America class, and it was their sense that their that the policies that had been followed by the previous administrations um, had eroded uh, their 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 work, uh, principally through the export of jobs to China and the deindustrialization of, of of the Midwest. Now, I of course uh, you and others know far more the dynamics in the, in, in the uh, European um, uh, setting. And, um, you know, maybe we need to also talk about, yes, it is definitely traditional working class groups that have been mobilized by the right, but what sort of consciousness do they have? You know, is it a kind of, you know, middle class that we have achieved a certain degree of prosperity and now those are being threatened uh, from, from, from their perspective by others. You know? So uh, I think that is a question that it would be good to discuss further tonight. Yeah, maybe we can also do this later. Um, one more question um, regarding your talk for India and the Philippines. You described how large parts of the population are dissatisfied because they feel and see that liberal democracy has not delivered on its promises. So is this mainly a question of economic inequality um, that still exists, or is this also about political representation and political participation? I think uh, both, because basically, um, if you look at the Philippines, um, the, uh, the inequality is, is, uh, is really great. Um, you're talking about uh, a country where the poverty rate is around 28% of the population. Um, we, we're also talking about um, a country that had experienced the overthrow of a dictatorship, and then there was a constitution that um, said all the right things about equality and how uh, equality needed to, agrarian reform had to take place, and you know that the importance of social rights and economic rights uh, it was the model, Inges here, it was the model UN constitution okay, that we had in the Philippines. And the reality between the model human rights UN constitution and the reality was just great. And, and so there was that great dissatisfaction. But politically, there was also the question whereby you had a democracy that was hijacked by the elites. Uh, basically, that we had tremendous competition among the elites in the Philippines, um, uh, but it was and 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 it was a competition that among the elites because they were the only ones who had the resources to be able to put up candidacies. So it was families among the elites that were basically competing in the political system and using the population and bribery and money and and, and all of that and advertising to be able to get to power. So there was a real sense that this was a democratic system that was not, that had really not delivered in terms of political participation of the masses uh, in terms of, you know, ha you know um, making decision making. So, um, so that's been, so I think th that, that was very central. Yes, it was both a protest against economic inequality as well as, um, the um, the political exclusion because of the way that the hi the elites had hijacked the uh, competitive democratic system. Um, I would say that this situation that you described that um, this makes it quite difficult to develop uh, counter strategies um, strategies against those counter revolutionary for forces for the left because. As you also said in your talk, if you want to do so, then on the one hand, you have to defend basic democratic values and basic liberal values because they are under attack from the far right. Um, but then at the same time, you have to distinguish yourself from this idea of liberal democracy that people are so discontent with. And you have to distinguish yourself or you have to make clear that you're not defending the liberal democracy of the elites. So um, what do you do about this? How could we find a way through this? dilemma well this is um, the dilemma of the left is different in different countries uh, there are both similarities as well as differences in the case of the Philippines I think the 
uh, you know, the problem that, that we face in the left uh, uh, is one side of the left has uh, um, become very much um, permanently um, identified with the armed guerrilla struggle uh, and you know, that the, of course, that part of the left has its own institutions that participate electorally, but basically the image still is that, you know, this revolution will be completed from the countryside surrounding the cities. So basically the main part of the left is basically fossilized in this strategy. Another part of the left, um, 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 of which I was a part, um, you know, decided to have a more parliamentary strategy, and uh, one, you know, and and part of the strategy was uh, making alliances with other political forces, and um, and of course, you know, when you do that, I think everybody here would be familiar with that in Europe is that. You have to know um, when you make alliances, you have to know when to leave alliances. And uh, when you, however, allow yourself to become the tail of your coalition partner, then uh, it becomes, you become embedded and you become tarnished by the reputation of that partner. And the social, the, 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 the Akbayan party that I belong to, which is, uh, you might say close to a social democratic party here in the United States, uh, in, 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 in Europe, um, basically made an alliance um, uh, around the whole issue of anti-corruption. But when the president of the Philippines, who headed up this coalition, began to use double standards, using anti-corruption to go after his enemies, but protecting his friends, then this was a time that that the, the, the left or the party had to make a break with the coalition. And I represented a group in the coalition that basically said, we can no longer participate in this government, we have to get out. And um, um, I was talking about the values of the party, they were talking about the strategies of the party, but they were really talking about the interests of the party and how many positions would be loose you know, if we withdrew. And so the danger, therefore, of the kind of social democratic kind of coalition politics um, is that before you know it, you've developed interests in a coalition with the elites because you have developed all these material interests of positions that you can't afford to withdraw. So what, what happened, basically, just to cut a long story short, is I, I resigned from the parliament. Uh, and I basically said I can no longer represent the party that continues this dirty coalition uh, with, with the elite. So both, I, I think that both these dominant sectors of the left had their own problems in terms of being able to reach out to people. But, but at the same time, I do think that um, we, can, we, we cannot abandon the idea of uh, a social alternative, you know, that really pushes real equality and real participatory democracy. That I think uh, it would be very important, you know, that we find a way to dissociate ourselves with the failings of liberal democracy and really energize this vision of a real democratic alternative in which equality uh, and uh, political participation are at the center. And um, we're seeing that now in places like the United States where socialism is being defined in new ways. Uh, but the big challenge for us in the Global South too is really how do we uh, rejuvenate and capture, recapture an idea of democracy that has unfortunately been defiled by the failings of liberal democracy. So it's a big challenge and I'm, I'm not one who, who would say that it's an easy transition to make. Yeah. Um, when it comes to the question of these um, counter strategies or strategies against those 
far-right political forces, then you often also um, highlight the importance of the women's movement. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to ask, what kind of role do you see for this movement in those attempts? Well, I see a very important role. Um, I, I think one of the really dynamic movements at this point in time is the women's movement, uh, whether it's in the global south or the north. And I think that, um, that these movements of the far right are often very explicitly un, you know, uh, misogynist uh, and very patriarchal, and therefore pose a very great threat uh, to, to, to women. And I think Duterte represents this threat because he is, you know, you know, in his language, you know, he 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 just constantly uh, denigrates uh, women, and and women in the Philippines feel, you know, many many women in the Philippines pretty much feel that they're under assault by the president himself. I mean, he has, he says that he's, he he wants to joke about rape, for instance, and rape is not a laughing matter. You know, and when people tell him that it's not a laughing matter, he even engage, engages even more in, in, in this thing. Like Duterte, you know, he's, he's deliberately politically incorrect, especially when it comes to women. You know, so, um, so I think the uh, women being especially threatened have a very central role to play, and the women's movement is, is quite dynamic, and, and I think they can infuse a lot of vigor into promoting uh, an alternative democratic uh, vision. Uh, I also think that um, uh, uh, we do need um, um, movements um, in the Philippines, uh, the Global South and the Global North, that, that bring people out of um, their class concerns um, uh, and, and bring them, uh, creates the possibility of real coalitions because of a common uh, big threat. Um, and uh, I would say that the, the threat of, of climate, uh, you know, uh, catastrophe, is one of those, you know, that um, I, I think we're beginning to see in, at least in the global north, you know, in the south, and, and in, in Europe, and and, and, and the, the um, United States, uh, I think that the successes of the Greens in the recent elections might indicate that this is, there is in fact the possibility whereby climate politics or the concern about the climate could begin to be a good antidote against the polarization that has taken place and even win over back to at least the progressive uh, uh, wing uh, if we dis define that broadly to include, you know, both working class parties and the Greens uh, away from, from the right. So I would say that, um, that women's movement and the climate movement uh, are the great potential to be able to win back people or to prevent people from falling into the clutches of the right. Yeah, I think this is also something that we can see in Germany. I feel like since we are not talking so much about the refugee crisis anymore here, but more about uh, climate change and climate crisis, the, it's uh, harder for the far right to be represented in those debates. And if they're not represented so much in the political debates uh, anymore, then that might um, they might suffer from this. Um, you also in, um, you spoke about the importance of charismatic politics and how charismatic politics always lead to a dangerous concentration of power. So what does this mean for these movements that we are speaking about now, um, for movements that want to challenge the far right? Should they bring up their own charismatic leaders or should they very much avoid to do so? Well, I, <laughs> uh, you know, this is, this is um, you know, something that we really need to look at very closely because I certainly think that um, we cannot imitate the methods of the right uh, uh, because these charismatic leaders, um, um, you know, part of their charisma is their being able to mobilize uh, a lot of regressive uh, human feelings, you know. Um, one is, for instance, the fear of crime. And suddenly, somebody like Duterte 
coming up with his submachine gun and says, I will defend you from the criminals. You know, and that's part of his appeal. I don't think anybody on the left can do something of that kind of thing without losing his own values. I think that, again, the re appeal to regression, which is that, hey, you know, we have been dominated by foreigners as far back as the 13th century, and, you know, Hindu civilization has been so wounded, but now, finally, you know, we are standing up, and our standing up, you know, means the subordination of Muslims, Christians, westernized intellectuals, and we are the majority, we, you know, but we are the majority, but it is defined as a cultural majority, and that's what they say democracy is all about, you know. Um, so again, there's that, there's that kind of um, regressive appeal uh, to the past uh, rather than to the future. So I would say that um, we cannot um, adopt the same methods of, uh, of depending on charismatic uh, personalities. Um, uh, but however, we can learn some things about, uh, you know, or maybe learn and look at ourselves. Uh, one is in all areas of the world, I think the left is very dependent on a rational appeal. Uh, that, that basically the, 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 the appeal is very vis um, cerebral, cerebral to people. Uh, and um, that rational appeal manifests itself in the importance of um, interests. You know, here are your interests, here are your material interests, and I will fulfill them. Uh, the elite, elite harms your material interests and uh, you know, we, we, you know, so, so basically I think that there's too much of this rational and interest question and sometimes the, um, the other aspects of people as political beings get neglected. So somebody once expressed that the, as, 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 as political people, we all, we need to be able to express it in an Americanism to hit people in the gut. Not, not gut in the sense of food, but there is that feeling that, you know, that I belong to this, this appeals to me, this is what my being is all about. And, um, and, and, and uh, when people try to explain Trump, they say the problem with Trump and his opponents is that Trump is able to get people in the gut, whereas his opponents appeal to the mind. And between the gut and the mind, the gut, um, uh, you know, is, 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 is wins out. So I guess what I'm trying to say is that how do we also get people in the gut so that we appeal not just to the mind, but to people's deep aspirations. And I think that is certain, certainly something that uh, we need to develop further. And again, I'm saying that I do not think we need to raise charismatic personalities like these two people. But nevertheless, we do need to examine our methods fairly closely so that we don't come across as too rationalistic, too rational, too focused on interests, and thinking that the interests, material interests, you know, are the things that, that will get us the allegiance of, of uh, people. Thank you. Ja, einer sent this. Um, okay, um, jetzt wechsle ich wieder ins Deutsche. Thank you very much. Dankeschön. Um, wir, jetzt wäre die Zeit für Fragen aus dem Publikum. Ja, genau. Um, ich würde ein paar Fragen sammeln und um, die dann am Stück beantworten lassen. Und das gibt das Saalmikrofon, was da rumgeht. Genau, da gibt es auch schon die ersten Meldungen. Mabuhay po. Um, <lacht> Magandang Gabi po. Guten Abend, mein Name ist Wilfred Oswe. Um, ich weiß nicht, ob ich auf Deutsch oder auf Tagalog spreche. Oder? Das können Sie machen, wie Sie möchten jetzt. <lacht> okay. uh, sorry, I'll just, I'll just um, speak in English para po mas madali. Uh, my name is Wilfred Oswe. I'm a teacher for refugees here in Germany. And I would like to ask you a question. Um, it's very interesting, um, um, the perspective that you gave today. Um, me as an overseas, uh, uh, overseas Filipino worker and also as a voter, 
here in Germany, I'm also quite um, invited by the rhetoric of uh, President Duterte during the election. You were talking about um, the transition from uh, President Aquino, your uh, former uh, <laughs> ally, to, to the current one. Um, I was really quite um, astonished as to the development because during the Aquino uh, the administration, it was good. The Philippine economy is doing well. And Duterte came and he said, okay, I will have a message. My message is anti-drugs. So my first question would be, uh, Professor, Congressman, I don't know how to address you. <laughs> but congressman. former Congressman, Professor, Sir, Sir, uh, how um, did Duterte pick the right potion? I mean, did Duterte pick the right enemy in the Philippines? Because you were talking about the communist and the um, yeah for for a time being China, but I would like to focus actually on the Catholic Church because you were you were talking also about the 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 a little bit you talked about uh, the religiosity of the Filipino people. Did you think that was a good strategy on his part to, to attack the Catholic Church? Because, you know, it, it sparked a little bit of, you know, uh, support from the, from the middle class. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, maybe that's... Okay, I actually, actually have a second then, question later na lang po. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I will get more questions. Yeah, also, one or two can we noch? Good evening. Uh, uh, my question is um, the PR, uh, not agencies, but uh, professionals, for example, uh, Edward Bernays um, in the USA, a nephew of uh, Sigmund Freud, uh, developed a very um, practical uh, way of using uh, psychological um, science or uh, evidences. Um, researchers uh, for uh, uh, big corporations, governments, and uh, other organizations. And uh, my problem is uh, seeing it one century uh, going on and, uh, and not being taught to uh, uh, the, uh, the children. Um, uh, do you think a psychological enlightenment, not as professional as uh, for corporations and uh, political parties, but uh, at least um, uh, a know-how of uh, what is my psyche, what are my emotions and uh, thoughts, how do they uh, uh, influence my, um, my acts or my behavior, even my, uh, my, my, um, my decisions uh, in, in my private life and also um, in society and uh, politically. And um, how do uh, myself uh, uh, in the uh, from the state uh, or the perspective of the uh, single children and uh, how do um, my groups uh, peer groups uh, my my nation my neighbors uh, uh, the people around me the, the European people because I heard uh, Joschka Fischer talking about a bit too much about Europe Europe and Europe and so on and what what's with the rest of the world uh, haven't heard uh, anything about this, and that that uh, led me to the uh, to the thought: Is the f uh, global feudalism um, uh, growing, but uh, uh, with less nationalism, but more uh, more continental um, peer groups? And um, yeah, my my question is in short. Uh, should children be taught uh, in a psy uh, a psychological enlightenment to be uh, immunized against uh, re re religious radicalism, national radicalism, any form of radicalism, and be um, as wise enough to make better decisions for themselves and for the whole mankind? Thank you. Okay, maybe we start with these two questions. <laughs> They're quite complex already, so... <laughs> Okay, well, thank you for the questions. I, I think these are two questions that we can spend the whole night uh, answering, uh, but I will not do that. 
First, uh, for my compatriots from the Philippines, I think that um, he, he raised a number of uh, re really key questions. Um, first of all, um, initially Duterte was a one-issue candidate, which is drugs. And drugs are the enemy. And drugs are killing the younger generation of Filipinos. Okay. And um, I think that... Um, uh, that was, um, in many ways, a successful strategy because it, he was able to see the fears, especially of the middle class, around crime and the way that that was associated um, with drugs and the prevalence of drugs. So I think that, in many ways, that sort of, um, you know, that reminds you of Hobbes, right? Because Hobbes said that principal way that the state comes into being is to protect the life and limb of people. And that's why they're willing to surrender their sovereignty to the absolute ruler. You know? So in many ways, I think that psychologically speaking, Duterte saw that there was this prevalent fear of crime. And coming from the Philippines, you know, you know how prevalent that is, especially among those who already have something, and especially on the middle class. So he was able to work in that. But the, what was interesting is that people saw him as this guy who he's already proven in his city of Davao that he can get rid of criminals through, an, you know, through extrajudicial execution. And he could also do that nationally. But beyond that, he reflected this image that he had what it takes to be able to discipline the elites, to tell the elites what to do, and especially to be able to root out corrupt people. Because you know this idea, this crime, um, the 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 inequality, uh, as well as corruption, these are three of the major concerns across the board in, in 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 the Philippines. And it's not just the middle class when it comes to crime but also lower class communities that are savaged by the drug problem. So uh, in, ma in other words, he was able to promote not only a stand on crime, but a projection that his tough stance you know, was what it would take to really reform Philippine society. Okay? So the, it's interesting that his most vocal support were Filipinos abroad. Okay, and if you look at the Filipinos abroad, it's interesting why, and I would say that there was a dissonance in their status, uh, because many of them come from middle class families, okay, uh, and have middle class education, but they don't have the opportunities for middle class occupations in the Philippines, so they are reduced to leaving the country to fulfill um, you know, working class occupations in the Middle East where they're abused and everything else. And, and I think that, you know, it, it was this sense that Duterte would be able to change things um, and, and finally get the Philippines back on track so that, you know, you know so that it, it would not have to force people like them abroad. Uh, and he himself could take care of their children in the Philippines who were threatened with drugs. So this this configuration came together to make him extremely popular uh, up to now, you know, in, 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 within the overseas uh, community. Um, and I, the crisis of the middle class, I'm very familiar with because I used to have the, I was the chair of the Committee on Overseas Workers Affairs in the Philippine Congress, in the Philippine Parliament. And you really see this, you know, you know when you go abroad, you meet people, there's just this this sense that you know they 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 had you know they had invested so much uh, in in terms of middle class education and everything, uh, but they have to do what they considered to be really uh, you know very humiliating work outside, especially in the Middle East, where they're routinely abused by their their employers. So um, the question on the Catholic Church. Um, why, uh, why did he, uh, his attacks on the Catholic Church um, um, not earn him more enmity 
Okay. Um, and here it's very interesting because I think that the Catholic Church in the Philippines um, blew a lot of its political capital by um, opposing family planning. You know, so the church was honestly the church was stupid enough, okay, to invest all its capital on opposing family planning. It's not even it's not abortion even, it's family planning, even the use of condoms. You know, uh, and 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 you know, I mean, the the all you know, you just had this massive reaction from you know the elites to the middle class to the poor, they just could not see, you know, why there was this irrational opposition uh, to family planning. And uh, it was only in 2012 that we finally had the reproductive health bill, and I'm so happy that I was one of the sponsors of the bill, you know, pass in the Congress, but for almost three decades, it could not get beyond just a first reading in Parliament because of the church opposing it. Now, I think what happened is that it lost a lot of its political capital and moral capital. And when Duterte came along, it was already a morally sagging institution. And when he started attacking them, uh, he, you know, it, nobody really came to the defense of the church, not even you know, the middle class, because they had been alienated by its uh, extremely doctrinaire stand on, on family planning. So I, I would say that um, the other thing, of course, is, um, as you know, it's very smart when it comes to this. Um, why, does, why does not the church hierarchy have an even um, greater opposition and speak about human rights even if they're not that popular at this point? The problem here is that Duterte has um, basically said, if you oppose me, I'm going to expose every one of you who have mistresses. I am going to expose every one of you who have children. Uh, you know, these are, uh, you know, we all know the Catholic Church. You're not supposed to have uh, mistresses and children. I'm going to expose every one of you who has two or three wives. And that effectively shut them up. No, I'm, I'm, I'm serious. They were not willing to be exposed. And so this is, this is uh, you know, I mean, of course, there are a few bishops and priests that are um, articulate, but unfortunately, this sort of politics of intimidation, of expose, has quieted the, the church. So I, I just wanted to address the three issues that you, you raised uh, in, in this. I think, though, that um, Duterte is not... Uh, He's not really like the old Marcos, a, a sort of a Machiavellian calculating politician. I think he's very instinctive. Okay? And I think this is what these charismatic leaders have in common. They're extremely instinctive politicians. And they're able to see what are the issues that would work, what issues will not fly, and how you can get to people's guts. Okay? And that is not sort of a calculating process. And this is where Duterte differs from Marcos, is Marcos was an extremely Machiavellian kind of guy who had all calculated things beforehand. He was so calculating, you know, that he calculated himself out of the equation, okay? Duterte would not make that mistake. He, he knows, he, he has a, what, what, did, what do the Americans call it? EQ. His EQ is very great, you know, uh, in, in this sort of thing. And this is what makes him much more dangerous than Marcos because um, he um, has an appeal to the people. You know, he cuts through to the people, whereas Marcos had no popularity and had to, re had to base his, his rule on the repressive agencies of the state. Okay? So this is the big difference. And I think that this kind of charismatic democratic appeal is in the long run more dangerous for a democracy you know, that, um, than the kind of rule that is using the armed forces or the police to be able to impose an unpopular kind of rule. 
Uh, in terms of the question, um, um, can a liberal universalist education that um, frees you from tribal and national loyalties early on, uh, you know, be a good, um, good way uh, to be able to prevent people from falling into the simplistic, nationalistic, um, primeval um, kind of uh, appeal of the right. Uh, well, I think it should. You know, there should. Uh, you know that. Uh, I think. Um, I mean, this is a part of the educational system that we really need to be able to instill in the younger people from from very early on. Uh, I would say that. Uh, I think many children would respond positively to that. Of course, there will be also people's children that will react negatively to it. And as being parents, you know that. You know, sometimes uh, some of your children um, would much rather oppose you, okay, uh, rather than follow what you want. And I think we need that kind of response too. However, there is an interesting point to this because um, in the Philippines, uh, again, speaking uh, from experience here, um, there was no education about the atrocities of the Marcos martial law period. And that was a period of about 14 years where you had very, very strong repressive rule. A lot of human rights abuses, torture, extrajudicial execution. And what was interesting was that uh, right after the overthrow of the regime in 1986, there was no follow-up effort to instill in the educational system, courses that would tell us what happened during that period, uh, that 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 would that would illuminate the minds of these younger Filipinos about the nightmare that we had, um, and uh, so where does the fault lie? I think in many people, but the first um, the first um, um, human rights education law that was passed. I'm sad to say that, again, I was the author of it, okay, was in 2013, okay, so many years after uh, martial law. And this is why a lot of young Filipinos basically, uh, with the lack of guidance on this score, think that the martial law was a great period, you know, and instead of the terrible period that it was. Um, now, the big question that I would ask, though, and I have no answer to this, is... Could such a law have made a difference? And what difference could it have made? Um, see if in 1986 we had something like that that would socialize uh, children to understand what happened, I think, yes, it would have contributed something to uh, uh, preventing our millen millennial generation from falling to the easy trap of the need for a strong man. But I am not sure if it would have been enough uh, because uh, in the context of the crisis of liberal democracy, its failure to deliver, there was just too great a discontent you know, that, as we know, the young are especially in the forefront of discontent. And I think whether or not that law was passed earlier, um, I think that we would still have had real problems in terms of many of our millennial generation finding uh, uh, Duterte uh, somebody that you know that promised uh, salvation. You know, so that's a sort of a complex answer to your question, but it, it was a very provocative question that that uh, made me think just now precisely about about the role of education. Uh, if it is not rooted in a change happening in the rest of the society. Yeah, it can certainly not only be education. Okay, so um, we have time for some more questions. I think there were some here in the front. Yeah? The mic is there. Yeah, thank you uh, very much. I'm Inga Kaulhetti, School of Governance. Uh, first of all, thanks for your interesting uh, uh, talk. 
uh, I would predict that the uh, um, uh, lifespan of the charismatic leaders is limited, you know, because soon uh, uh, people will find that they don't deliver either. So therefore, my question to you is, what would, would be the key features of a new democratic system nationally that delivers? And since we are living in a world of interdependence of many types, how would a new multilateralism look, a new democracy at the international level uh, that delivers? And a third brief question, do you see somewhere, maybe here in this room or house, a nucleus of a beginning counter-revolution to the counter-revolution? Uh, because we have to get ready, you know. We, uh, we, uh, <laughs> either you go home and write the next book so that we can discuss the future, but we have to think of an attractive alternative that goes to the gut. <laughs> okay, so these were two questions already, but I think we can take one more. Yeah, if you could just pass. Thank you very much. My question, Mr. Bello, is... Um, Maybe just a side question, but unfortunately not an irrelevant one, especially for the Philippines and India. Um, so my question would be, how do we counter fake news with the Philippines basically, basically being the ground zero for Facebook warfare in uh, democratic campaigns? And the same is happening in India. And I really like what you said about uh, capturing the gut. So how, how do we get people who are so far removed from us where or who are so f or so far re removed from what we perceive to be the truth and um, people to whom lies seem to speak more truth than the actual truth how how do we burst that bubble yeah, yeah then one more question yeah schönen dank für ihre ausführung um, okay also schönen Dank für Ihre Ausführungen, die waren für mich wirklich sehr, also vieles sehr neu. Ich würde so ein bisschen Bedenken oder ich sage jetzt mal Kritik äußern, weil ich persönlich nicht an einer positiven Entwicklung, also im Rahmen unserer bestehenden Systeme, glaube, also Begründung eigentlich dafür, Sobald also ähm, Menschen, Parteien, Institutionen äh, in irgendeiner Form an die Macht kommen, dass sie ähm, also für mich eigentlich durch die Schlagworte Geld oder persönliche Macht also korrumpiert werden und damit also Teil des Systems werden. Ähm, für mich wäre also die wichtige, also für mich würde sich eine wichtige Frage stellen, ähm, ob Sie Überlegungen diesbezüglich haben und was gegebenenfalls also ähm, Änderungsansätze sein könnten. Vielen Dank. Dankeschön. Gut, dann, ja, yeah, okay. Sure, I, um, these are all very important uh, questions um, to answer, Inge, first, uh, and again, I have no definitive answers. Uh, let me just say that um, I am not quite sure uh, whether we can predict that these regimes will be, lifespan will be short. And um, um, after all, you know, the Salazar government in Portugal lasted for something like 46 years, okay, <laughs> or 42 or 46 years. And the Franco government lasted for about 36 years. And um, this wasn't just because they used the policies of the state, but they did have uh, a base uh, in the population, a fascist base, that uh, allowed them to, to rule relatively undisturbed for a long time. So, um, I certainly hope that these governments will have a short lifespan, but I'm not willing to bet on it. <laughs> so that's the first thing. So um, the second thing is, I think, related to the question, um, um, 
what do we really offer? Um, and I think the big question is, as I said earlier, it has to be a real democracy, a genuine substantive democracy that does um, um, put equality uh, at the center, put cooperation among human beings at the center, and puts real political participation by all at the center. Um, and um, the big question, I think, is, and the big issue of debate is whether that is possible under capitalism. Okay. And so uh, can we really have such a liberal democratic system under the current regime of global capital, uh, where it seems like it, uh, it, its intense search for profit uh, is even more intense now than in 2009, where capital has become so um, against any kind of reform that all the reforms that were promised by the G20 in Pittsburgh in 2009, none of them have actually taken place. So the, the, the too big to fail banks have become even too big to fail. Okay. All those uh, um, uh, securities that were traded, like mortgage-backed securities, um, uh, what they call subprime securities and derivatives, they are all you know, still being traded in large and large quantities. Um, the big stars of the new financial world, uh, the hedge funds and the private equity funds um, that control about $100 trillion, um, are totally unregulated. And the, you know, all of this activity relies on the continual pumping of the central banks of liquidity into the system so that the global debt grows and grows and grows and the system becomes even more fragile. Uh, and of course, we're not even talking about the impact on the climate and the rise of you know, uh, and the, the emergence of key sectors of the capitalist class, like the Koch, Koch brothers, that are against any sort of, uh, of uh, and Trump himself, of course, against any sort of controls on emission uh, controls. And so um, this relates again to the question of uh, the person out there is, um, uh, can we really offer an alternative unless we move beyond the paradigm of capital. Okay. And um, my, my, my gut sense is that we can't. Uh, that I think that the possibilities for reform were really pushed over the last 10 years. And um, when Obama came to power, for instance, in the United States, um, his big promise then was, he said, uh, I am here to reform the financial system. And then he met together with bankers in New York, and he told them, look, the only person that stands between you and the pitchforks, meaning the peasants who kill them, uh, is me. So you better behave. But what happened is that Obama prioritized saving the banks, okay? And in fact, no reform took place because within his own administration, he gave tremendous power to people who were very close to Wall Street. So uh, I, I think that we need to, to say, uh, we need to take into consideration the fact that maybe the chance for reform is over, okay? Um, I just finished my own book on the global finance. It's called um, um, uh, Paper Dragons, the... the um, the um, um, China and the next crash, uh, where I argue that the financial system globally is more fragile now than in 2008. Why? Because we have a major new actor that was not a source of fragility before, and that is China. And China's financial system is in very big trouble at this point in time. And if China's financial system, which is ridden with tremendous crisis at this point in time, and uncontrolled speculation collapses, that means the Chinese economy, real economy collapses, and that means 
that um, because China is so central in world trade, we will also have a global economic collapse. So that's the argument that I make at this point in time. So again, I, I would say that it's well and good to have proposals, and there have been many proposals about limiting executive pay, getting rid of credit ratings agencies, um, nationalizing banks that are too big to fail, um, um, having alternatives to the dollar as a currency for global trade, having a new Bretton Woods system in which we would have a new multilateral system. Uh, I think these are all well and good proposals, but unless we have a basic change um, uh, in the way that we, reorg we organize our economic life, I don't think that reforms will be sustained or are sustainable. So uh, I, I would say, therefore, that I am of the school that basically would say that we really have to tie in um, um, uh, um, then uh, we really need to tie democracy to its economic and social roots and that we really need a post-capitalist kind of system if we are to be able to offer such an alternative to people and mean it and win them over from the way that they're going to the far right at this point in time. So uh, that's my... I don't know whether that's a pessimistic or an optimistic answer, but. I certainly don't think this kind of democracy is possible under this current regime of global capital. And I, that's also been... Yeah, I think... Yeah, <laughs> now the, Both questions the last point here is also extremely important. Um, clearly, social media has played a role in terms of the, um, um, promoting the interests of these regimes. Um, and the, in, in India, I think the, the BJP uh, is so far ahead of the other parties like the Congress Party in having millions and millions and millions of, of people that are followers. Uh, I think the Congress Party just began maybe about a year ago beginning to assemble you know, it, its own set. <laughs> you know? So it seems like the traditional parties all were outmaneuvered into the role of the social media. Uh, by, 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 by the, you know, this, this people. Secondly, that yes, there are trolls. Um, there are people that troll um, the, 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 the internet. They, they lock in upon opponents of Modi, upon opponents of Duterte, and um, they discredit them and they scare them from engaging in internet dialogue. Uh, I would say that that happens. However, having been, uh, engage in internet warfare myself, okay? Um, and um, I would say that about 75% of the people that I have engaged in battle with are not trolls. They really, really are people speaking from the gut, okay? They are so angry that they're incoherent. You can spot a troll because an a, a troll makes very glib sort of remarks, and it's all like, you know, it's, uh, it, it's, they're reading from a script. But not these people. The most of the people really like, you know, they, whether in Tagalog or in, or in English, you know, they have very incoherent remarks, but what they have is real anger. Real anger that, why are you opposing this man who is the hope of the Filipino people? And, and that, and I think that this is same all over, that uh, I would put the causality around. Okay? I would say that it's more a case of angry people discovering social media than from trolls sort of manipulating the social media and using people to be able to, 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 to build up resources for the right. So uh, I, again, my, 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 my plea here is it's very easy explanation to say that people are manipulated. Whereas in fact, the relationship between the personality and the people is a mutually constructive one. You know? And we should not, uh, we should not uh, if we do not understand that, my sense is that we're, go we're going to go for the wrong strategies. 
you know. And unfortunately, um, certainly in many sectors of the progressive movement in the global south, it's the easy explanation that people have because they can't understand why people who should be supporting them are moving towards the right. And the easy explanation is because they're m being manipulated. Unfortunately, that's just not the case. Unfortunately, people are opening themselves up to manipulation, you know. Uh, and, and so it's, it's a constructive um, uh, relationship rather than a one-way street, I would say. Okay, vielen Dank. Thank you very much. Oh, yeah, there's another one. Ähm, Dankeschön, dann würde ich jetzt an der Stelle den offiziellen Teil der Veranstaltung ähm, beschließen. Es gibt aber noch Getränke und auch ähm, zu essen da hinten und es gibt ähm, Bücher von Walden Bello hier und der hat sich auch bereit erklärt, also die sind zum Verkauf und der hat sich auch bereit erklärt, die zu signieren. Das heißt, möglicherweise wird er auch noch die ein oder andere Frage dann dort beantworten können. Ähm, vielen Dank, dass Sie heute gekommen sind und hier zugehört haben. Ähm, vielen Dank an die Rosa-Luxemburg-Stiftung, vielen Dank an die Übersetzer und besonders vielen Dank an Walden Bello, dass er heute hier war. Um, and, uh, the book's there, but there was also supposed to be a slide that would eliminate Duterte and eliminate Modi and give you a more pleasant image. Thank you.